um, is not on the program, but with that, we're going to start with our uh, Pledge of Allegiance and also singing of the National Anthem, and then we'll start with that program. So at this time, please all rise. The Pledge of Allegiance will be done in five minutes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be extended. The pledge of allegiance will be done here by Andrew. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Traffic is what you see, what you get in Miami Dade County. Uh, and you know, uh, we heard that 95 is closing, it closed down a little bit because of an accident from South. Turnpike had a little mishap as well, but this is Miami Dade County. I'm so glad everyone is here. I want to introduce you to our counterpart, our co -moder moderator for this morning. Oh. 
Traffic is what you see, what you get in Miami-Dade County. Uh, you, you know, uh, we heard that 95 is closing, closed down a little bit because of an accident from South. Turnpike had a little mishap as well, but this is Miami-Dade County. I'm so glad everyone is here. I want to introduce you to our counterpart, our co-moderator for this morning, Mildred Dupree de, de Robles from the Department of Justice, CRS, with Community Relations Services. So I'm going to introduce to you at this time, Major. I'm Mildred Dupre de Robles, Conciliation Specialist with the United States Department of Justice, Community Relations Service. I serve in the office um, in Miami, in uh, Florida. It's one of the states that I serve in my position. We're so glad that we have very important people that everyone's important, but we have some people from our, our city and the county representing all of us um, that will come up and say hello to us. But so without further ado, uh, let me introduce to Philip Tavernier, the Public uh, Affairs Manager of North Miami Beach to come up and introduce uh, one of our favorite commissioners of North Miami Beach. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Sakpasi. Wagwan. Doche. What's up? Namaste. White, black, non, what you know. So many different cultures, races, ethnicities languages, foods, dances. I don't think there's, there's probably very few cities that boast so many dance studios because dance is a part of culture. So in a day and time where culture and um, diversity and the question of what it means and how we should respond to it is at the forefront in the world, right now. This is a wonderful time to have this kind of an event. So on behalf of our city manager, uh, Arthur Sori III and his staff, on behalf of our city attorney, our um, uh, city clerk, and without question on behalf of our mayor and commissioners, we'd like to welcome you all to the city of North Miami Beach. It's an honor and a pleasure to host this very important event today. And um, it's very difficult to follow also after this wonderful rendition of the Star Spangled Banner one more time for not only um, our singer of the Star Spangled Banner but the man who had the vision to kind of pull this together and do all that one time for Joshua Ho who did so much for today one more time. So without any further ado I would like to bring up how he described one of our favorite commissioners ladies and gentlemen a woman who is no stranger to public policy she is no stranger to boots on the ground, no stranger to what it looks like to be on the streets dealing with conflict and confrontation for nearly 30 years in the city of Miami Police Department. Some of you all know Commissioner Polly Villar. We know her as Sarge. We're gonna say Sergeant Villar. Uh, will you all please bring up our wonderful Commissioner Paul Villar up to the stage. Young men who just spoke, <laughs> but.
but um, my name is uh, Commissioner Polly Deloitte and as a retired police sergeant from the city of Miami, I think it gives me an honor to be in a position to, to say yes to Mr. Josh. When he called me and said he wanted to host this event in the great city of North Miami Beach, I'm like, wow, this is, this is what it is to be a leader. Not only that I'm happy that, you know, those things that, things that we see every day hate crime, but um, as a police officer, as a commissioner, as an immigrant, I know what it is to suffer what the hate crime is all about. But you know, we're not gonna take that time to say anything like that. I wanna welcome you on behalf of the great city of North Miami Beach, mayor and commissioner here, and the city manager, Arthur Soray, to host this great event in our city. And um, I just wanted to share uh, and the city of North, uh, North Miami Beach Police Department, one of the greatest city, if not the greatest city uh, police department in Dade County. We're not talking about Miami Dade. Miami Dade is great too, so city of Miami is great as well. But anyway, I just wanted to, <laughs> North Miami Beach is one, okay. And I, I just wanted to share this uh, quote uh, from Martin Luther King. I look to a day when people will not be judged by the level in 12 years with a significant increase that were reported in numbers of anti-Asian and anti-black hate crimes. In May 2021, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act was signed into law and with this legislation in response to the dramatic increase of hate crimes and hate incidents against Asian Americans and Pacific Islander communities during the COVID-19 pandemic, community forums and listening sessions were facilitated to learn from community on their observations about the increase of these incidents during the pandemic, but also with an interest to help address what will happen after to also with an interest on the type of guidance that will be useful to address this matter as a community. So today presenters um, are aimed to raise awareness about the scorch of hate crimes and hate incidents, um, specifically in Miami Dade focus and to propel the use of awareness as a tool for action, response, and prevention again. Acknowledging that some incidents motivated by violence are not hate crimes under federal or state law, but may still be unlawful under civil anti-discrimination laws, this facilitated community engagement will assist for all of us to understand better with additional clarity. How is it that local, state, and federal agencies in the Southern District of Florida, specifically Miami-Dade, work together in collaboration? So at this time, I want to um, address that a hurdle to awareness of the increase in hate crimes and hate incidents is the lack of clarity and a universal definition of what is a hate incident and what is a hate crime, especially among different local and state jurisdictions. So for the purposes of tracking hate crime data, how is it that the federal government defines a hate crime or a hate incident? And how is it that the state defines hate crime or hate incident? Is there a difference? Well. Uh, uh, good morning, my name is Bob Senior. I'm a chief of the public corruption and civil rights section in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Florida, uh, down here in downtown Miami. Um, uh, we do 
have responsibility for criminal civil rights with regards to the question of which we do a number of cases in that area for reasons that I'll explain. Uh, not a lot of them are hate crimes. Uh, starting off with what is a hate crime? Uh, it's codified in the United States Code pursuant to the act that Mildred mentioned at 18 USC United States Code section 249. And a hate crime in federal law, and Kathleen will be explaining the differences in state law. In federal law, a hate crime is a act of violence, such as an assault, a murder, something with violence, or a real threat of violence that is motivated due to someone's bias. It's a bias against people of a certain race, of a certain religion, sexual identity, uh, things, all the protected classes in the statute. So that's the simple version of what a hate crime uh, is in federal law. An incident is one, and I remember that we had it in our office, and I believe the state attorney's office looked at it as well, is there was an incident where an Asian American woman um, uh, was being harassed on a bus, and she was being called names, and it was all in relation to COVID-19, and I think we can all remember, and we all know when that was a at a, a, a much, it still does, at, at too far of a grade of a rate. So these things were happening and law enforcement was contacted, but that is an incident under federal law because this person was not in any way, she did not, she was not threatened with violence nor was she actually uh, violently attacked, either assault or, or, or murder. So, that's kind of the, the way that the federal hate crime works, uh, if that answers your question. And obviously, Kathleen is an expert on what the state does. Thank you, Bob. Hello. My name is Kathleen Hogue. I'm a chief assistant state attorney with the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office. Um, and uh, I'm going to piggyback on what Bob Sr. has said about hate crimes. There is no, in the state law, Florida state law, there's no um, statute which says this is a hate crime. There are um, criminal offenses and then we have a hate crimes, uh, or I'm going to say it for lack of a better word, a hate crimes enhancement so that if a crime such as an assault or a battery or you know actually any crime, predicate crime, is committed and the motivation for that crime is prejudice that motivation can be shown to be a basis for committing that crime, prejudice based on religion, um, based on race, based on nationality, based on um, sexual orientation. Um, I can, I'm gonna read you the statute real quick and, uh, and hopefully that will explain it. That elevates that crime to become a crime which has been committed under the state of Florida and is enhanced by classification and by penalty to have a special um, penalty and enhanced in classification to become a hate crime. And in order to get that increased penalty and that greater enhancement of the classification, um, we have to be able to prove the hate aspect, the, the fact that it's done with prejudice against the person based on those criteria. Um, Otherwise, we also have to prove the crime itself, the assault, the battery. There has to be that underlying crime. So hate speech without a, a predicate crime, without a crime attached to it, someone actually assaulting or battering or threatening to do something to a person does not evidence a crime in the state of Florida. So just to, to explain, if if you have, we have misdemeanors and we have felonies. So the penalty for any felony or misdemeanor is gonna be reclassified as provided in this subsection of the law, okay? Um, if the commission of such felony or misdemeanor evidences prejudice based on race, color, ancestry, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, homeless status, 
or advanced age of the victim. So if you have a person who commits a battery, which is a misdemeanor on a person, and it's evidenced by the motivation against um, an Asian American, and there is evidence that that's the basis for the battery, that misdemeanor battery is now gonna become a third degree felony, and it's going to be not only enhanced in a felony, but it's going to have a greater penalty. So if that explains that. And if I can answer, um, so that's the federal law and the state law, so how do the two mix, right? Under the statute that I cited, 18 U.S.C. section 249, it, within the statute it talks about how um, the state is, is to be uh, allowed to address these matters, which are traditionally state crimes, right? assault, battery, murder, those are not federal crimes under the federal statute. Um, so our hate crime statute is designed and it specifically says within the statute to defer actions to the states to, to handle these matters. But uh, Willie Creech, who will introduce himself sitting to the right of Kathleen, is with the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. What, what the federal government does is they monitor these cases. They work with the state attorney's office to keep abreast of them. Uh, as we all know, there are certain areas in the country where, to put it politely, the enforcement of individual civil rights are not as high a priority as other places in the country. Um, but I am really happy to say that the state attorney's office under Catherine Fernandez Rundle with where Kathy, uh, 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 Kathy works, as well as the Broward State Attorney's Office, both have dedicated units, I think 15 years, for the State Attorney's Office, and they prosecute hate crimes very, very aggressively, all right? So we monitor that, but what that allows us to do is work on the cases in other areas. If they're taking care of all the hate crimes, we can look at uh, Detective Menacall from Hialeah who's sexually harassing women who was uh, sentenced a month or so ago in prison violence cases that we've tried. And the former chief of Biscayne Park who uh, uh, falsely arrested two young black men in order to get a clearance on some burglaries because he was suffering local political problems. We can be, we are active in civil rights investigations, but I just wanted to explain why hate crimes are done by the states because that's the way the federal statute was intended to act and again our state attorneys are very very proactive in this area of hate crimes so the state attorney identified the protected categories under the state law are there any other protected categories that are at the federal level that are not listed with the state and what happens there are um, uh, certain things like, like transgender, for example, and, and uh, we were talking about uh, a matter that you're looking at, and you can talk about it uh, as well, uh, but I, there are certain areas, and I know transgender is one of them, um, but even if a crime is committed, that somebody is murdered, and let's say that the, the motive for that crime was someone's hate, they're biased against individuals who are transgender, uh, it's still a murder, right? And the state still runs with it, and we will still follow that. Um, if something were to happen, maybe a jury would acquit or something like that, despite strong evidence, then we would continue to look at that. But I'll, I'll let you talk about it. That's your case, not mine. Actually, gender um, is not um, you yeah. know, one of the protected classes. Um, just this year, I know, and last year, the US Attorney's Office on what happened. If they fail to show up for these depositions, they have no other choice but to drop the charges. So it, help, it helps us help us help you. Um, trust, trust in the community. There's a reason we're all sitting up here, to develop that trust in the community. Right? We do care and we wanna see that. Some things that we're working on is documentation. Documentation to prove that bias. The bias, that incident where it's just an incident, someone's calling you names or something has to be reported, has to be documented. Because six months from now, if that individual decides to do an assault or homicide or something, 
we have that history of bias, racial bias or discrimination on hand. So we can then provide that information to the state attorney's office and then they can prove that bias. Without that information, it's very difficult to prove. So we do rely on you on both sides to report it, the difference between an incident or a crime. Just remember, it, we don't have a crime law such as that. It's more of an enhancement. So a crime has to be committed and we have to prove that bias. And to prove that bias, we have to get the report to say this individual has a long history of racial bias or discrimination. With that information, providing to the state attorney's office or U.S. attorney's office, they can then prosecute. And the victims who have to show up, they have to show up to testify. Many times we've had the victims totally ignore our detectives' calls. They don't answer back, they, they fail to show up. So the individual is not prosecuted. So we do rely on the help of the community. Thank you. Other forms of um, reporting come in. Um, other than see something, say something, you got the CSA app as well. You got Fortify Florida, if it relates to, um, uh, if it relates to schools. That could be reported through there. Also, Crime Stoppers, think about that. That's anonymous. And a non emergency, I believe somebody said that before. And securing um, Florida.org for cyberbullying along those lines as well. So, and before closing that, um, Mayor Ochoa, what happens if a community member reports an incident and there is a perception that that report? Is, is not taken seriously or is not being uh, documented as reported. What, is the, what are the mechanisms then, uh, that, uh, to redress that perception? So in North Miami Beach, we take all reports seriously. Um, so for example, if somebody calls in a call regarding a suspicious person, um, everything is documented in our CAD system. Um, any incident of a battery or an assault, a report will be written, it gets assigned to a detective and will be investigated. In our policy, we will be contacting that victim within 72 hours and we follow the up on it. And that victim has the ability to call that sergeant and speak to that sergeant. Um, we're a smaller agency, so we have the ability to do that. Um, that. That's a good thing about being a smaller city. We have that ability that, you know, kind of, you know, that's great, you know, we have that ability to do that. But the victims have that ability to contact the sergeant, the captain, and even the major at times. I speak to victims all the time and I explain to them, hey, it's not really a hate crime, it's more of this, and I explain their steps on what the remedies are. If I may uh, add, so um, what the major is talking about is, and I think what the, she was talking about is, so if you call the police, um, and and I get this as well as he does, um, the officer decides, hey, listen, this is just, it's a no report, that's what we call it, right? Um, this guy you know, has first minute issues, he's calling you names, he's calling you gay, you know, black, brown, whatever reason, um, you don't need to write a report. It's not a criminal matter. The process to get that report written is to call a supervisor. You, you can, you have that process, right? Um, at every level. Um, I want to say that all Miami-Dade County officers do the right thing and write that report, but at my level, from what I've seen, it doesn't always happen. As civilians and as uh, constituents, you guys need to know your rights. So feel free to call the communication dispatch, listen, I would like to see a police officer or a supervisor. If they do not um, uh, solve your issue, just go up one more, right? I can tell you, having been uh, command, commander, supervisor, manager for many, many years now, um, that there are several of you in the audience right now that have called me and asked this, uh, and I will tell you the same thing. Call back, ask for a supervisor, all the way up the chain to get a report documented. Because what I've realized as we, uh, um, you know, as, as the many immigrants that come into South Florida, right? They think that the first officer they see, they're a figure of authority, uh, that when it's a no report, it stops there. Does that make sense? They do not realize that you can actually go a little bit further. You know, and, and I can tell you, once it gets to my level, it should not, it should be at a lieutenant's level or a supervisor level. Um, then that means one of our officers failed to do what they were supposed to. And you are allowed to call and ask to speak to a supervisor to get that report written. So hopefully that answers your question. If I could add just something to that. Um, 
but especially with some of the larger departments, there have been times uh, when um, things have not been taken, they don't believe things have been taken seriously, a victim has it. The state attorney's office opened up a hotline um, to take reports, concerns. Um, we and then, of course, will turn around and go back to the police agency. But sometimes things do fall through the cracks, so we do have a hotline. But I think there's something that's even more important. We have built up, because we've been doing these crimes for, as Bob Sr. said, the last 15 years, um, and one of the gentlemen that uh, I supervise, his name is Justin Funk, and I kind of laugh because his name is out there, okay? We, we have been participating in community groups um, and in forums like this for some time. And so um, I would encourage um, each group to, you know, to, to, you know, make it possible for you. I know if someone gets in touch with Joshua, um, you know, even if they've tried to report it, Joshua will immediately call Justin. He's our, he's of my division chief and he's the person that supervises all of the attorneys that handle the hate crimes and I supervise him. Um, but we've built, you know, partnerships and we have people that, um, that can be accessed within our office immediately. You know, everybody has cell phone numbers and, you know, well, we have their email addresses. So um, I would encourage that as a pathway also because sometimes when you call, you know, the big police department, you can get lost, you know, in the shuffle there a little bit. Um, and that's why I think the community access to us is, is very, very important in building these partnerships. And we have them, believe me. Um, you know, people call Justin day and night. Uh, you know, at least not only <laughs> I know, at least not only do that, but um, but you know the um, um, different community leaders. Um, you know, so we we have that as an alternate form, especially in this day and age. So uh, I think building up strong community um, awareness and the ability for them to report to their own communities will also strengthen future reporting because that's a, a definite avenue of access. And I think building that community relationship is, is huge amongst us. And I know law enforcement has been progressively moving forward on that, trying to help out the fears of reporting to police officers or reporting to a police agency. I know we recently just had, and I believe I just saw him walk in the Miami-Dade Community Relationship Board, just met at uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement to talk about effective change of moving forward and also combining with that community to help out with those fears. So law enforcement continue making that progress. I think we will see a, a, a drastic um, change of reporting. Yeah. Can, I, can I add one thing? Um, we talked about, Kathleen and I talked about what is a hate crime, and then there was references to hate speech. So now all of you as community leaders know the difference between the two. But I just want to emphasize, I think Kathleen will back me up on this, that the reporting of hate speech serves the interests of prosecuting hate crime. So it is very important to report hate speech. Why is that? Let's say uh, there, there, there's an assault or a battery uh, and a person is arrested. And the only evidence that that assault or battery was motivated by a person's hate, the only evidence of that is the victim saying, well, he called me this name or that name while he was beating me. Um, that can be, that's a close call. Whereas the, the, the defendant might say, well, no, I didn't. They're just making that up. And then it's left to members of the public and the jury to kind of make uh, uh, their decision on as to whether that's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt that hate was the motivating factor. Well, if Kathleen or our office can go into a database and can see that there has been reported incidents of hate speech against this same defendant in earlier matters, then that evidence can take it over the top and cause the successful prosecution of a hate crime. So reporting hate speech is a useful tool, very useful tool in getting successful prosecutions of hate crimes. And that is not to say that a person has to have a history in order for us to prosecute them. But as was just said, we have to have the proof. And sometimes the proof is the, is the biggest problem. Um, you know, thank God in this day and age, to be real honest with you, people take cell phone videos, uh, people, 
you know, there's, there's video just about everywhere you go. Um, there's, there are other things that we will look to to sort of shore up what was said at the scene, you know, witnesses hopefully to the crime. I mean, there's many other ways in which we can develop a case, but, but having someone with a documented history is, um, is a real, and you know, usually people do have some history of it. It doesn't just happen one time. It's happened before. Um, and so that documented history is really very, very valuable. If I could add to that, yeah. from an investigative standpoint, that helps my detectives build a case for, for prosecution. It helps a case for a risk protection order to get an RPO in the past. Um, that helps us, our investigators, to build for a hot call, meaning in the CAD system. Um, God forbid there's a house, uh, a gun in that house or something. It helps us moving forward into the future. Um, a lot of these things that have happened on active shooters, oh yeah, we knew that house was a problem, but it was never documented. The neighbors never said something. So it is important that it is, please call the police, document it, because now we build a history on that. A lot of times they said, oh yeah, there was a shooting in that house two weeks ago, but we never called the police. Well, why not? It's, we don't know about it. So police, we don't know what your neighborhoods, we know our, we know our neighborhoods at our house, but if you see something, Airbnbs in your neighborhoods, right? You know it, but if you don't tell us, we gotta know. All right, so please, if it's going on in your neighborhoods, please tell the police, you guys are the best crime prevention tools that we have. Let us know because that's we start, we start addressing them right away. So thank you. That is a key point that we want to, we want to drive home today. Thank you. Um, so how does um, the Department of Homeland Security Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency intersect in the prevention and response to hate crimes? So, um, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, is a preventative agency, okay? You call us before things go bad. If things go bad, call these guys with the guns, because I'm not coming. I'm sitting on the couch. I will forward your call. I will tell you who to call, but I'm not the one coming. What we do, we educate, we train, we help you plan, okay? In the event of an active shooter, I'm sure show of hands, how many of you people here know what to do? Know, have a plan. How many of you have practiced that? Not a lot of hands. So if you are approached and someone uh, commits a hate crime or hate speech against you, how many of you know what number to call? How many of you know who to call? How many of you know who's coming when you call? Okay, that's what CISA's focus is. We're gonna teach you what to report, what to look for, how to respond, what are your options, all right? Everybody here has an option. Homeland security begins with hometown security, all right? If you guys are reporting crimes, creating statistics, showing trends, what do you think that does for your community? That empowers the law enforcement to request funds and, and people and actually put man hours into investigating trends that are happening within your area. We can't do anything that we don't know about. So that's what uh, my partner Gary Warren and I will do. We'll come, we'll come to your church, we'll come to your business, we'll, we'll come to your, your, your knitting club. <laughs> There's Gary. Um, we are designed to create a culture of security, okay? What, what is a culture of security? It is a group of like-minded people that are actually and actively engaged in security on a day-to-day -day basis. Be aware. Don't cross the street when you see something. Make a phone call. Know who to call. And we'll go more into some of these responses and some of these trainings and some of the th products that CISA offers. But yeah, we're here for you. We're, we are federal employees. You've already paid for us. Go ahead and utilize us. Thanks. Emery? Um, good afternoon. My name is Emery Nowden. I'm with the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships with Homeland Security. Um, we pretty much work hand in hand with everybody at this table in some way, form, or fashion. Um, you have a great all-star team up here, and there's a lot of work that's already done in your communities. Um, myself specifically, I'm responsible for Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. 
um, but I reside here in Florida, and we are approaching the prevention space from a public health model and a behavioral aspect, where we're looking at the individual connections in the communities and trying to create local prevention frameworks, which is a grouping of a multidisciplinary team to address those issues from the community out. Um, every community is different. I can't take something in New York and bring it to Miami and say it's gonna work. Um, you know your communities, you know who, are, who your players are in the communities, and what aspects of this local prevention framework could, book, could best help your communities. What this framework will do is bring together specialists from the healthcare field, uh, mental sciences, social work, law enforcement, all of those areas, and help to create a system of not just reporting, but an ability to provide assistance to individuals who may be radicalizing or mobilizing to violence. Our space is to try to stop that individual from ever going into a grocery store and, and targeting individuals, or going into a school, or something like that. We have data now, unfortunately, in this country, there's been so many um, incidents like Buffalo and Texas where we're starting to see the trends, we see the data. A lot of agencies are doing work on this. And so what we're seeing is that a lot of the times, most of the times, someone around that individual noticed a change in their behavior. They either didn't know who to tell, they did tell someone and it fell through the cracks, or they just didn't report it. So what we're trying to do with this local prevention framework is basically cast a net over your area. You already have some legislation, some programs in place. FDLE has a program. There's a lot of other um, organizations that have programs in this space. What we're trying to do is throw a net over it and close the gaps. We don't want these things to fall through. In a lot of these situations, what we're seeing is someone saw something, it might have even been reported, but that, that incident, that individual, managed to fall through the cracks. And then they resurfaced a year later, two years later, five years later, and there you have the incident. So when we have our breakout session, um, my session will be about how to create these frameworks, how to recognize individuals that might be radicalized or mobilized to violence, what it actually means. The terminology can be so confusing. There's a term for this, a term for that. We're, we're in the space, so we know the terms, but you might not necessarily know them. So my my community awareness briefing is what it's called. We'll go through and give examples of case studies, um, what the trends were, some of the verbiage, things like that, and how to create the local prevention framework. I have Mr. David O'Leary with me. Um, the great thing about my program is we bring money. He's, he's in charge of our grants program. Um, we have some great grants going out throughout the country. We have some here in Miami that have already been um, awarded. And so that he'll be also um, in my presentation, and he'll be able to speak to that. So thank you for having me. So I'm going to ask some of the, you know, my only part that I know about reinforcing uh, rules is I was a dean of discipline at North Miami Middle. So my kids are telling me, Mr. Ho, this is happening. I go, can I give information? Because the, 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 the catch word is snitches get stitches, right? So sometimes we feel that when we report, there seems like we're gonna be victimized again because we had to face them again. In my neighbor, if someone said, hey, Asian guy reported, if I'm the only Asian guy, then it's gonna be me. We have many religious organizations represented here. Let's say a Hindu person is a, you know, then they look around, hmm, we're gonna be isolated. Is that protection? I know that we want to say it, but what can we do? I know that after 9-11, there are a lot of people just seeing, they were afraid to say their word, and they were fearful. I know that uh, Cosmos, I know that Shabir here was on our board before, worked so hard with a former director as well. And we have a Buddhist here, we have representatives from Hindu again, from, um, from Christians too, and Jewish, my friends. What can we do? What, is there any protection from the local level to the state level, federal level, so that I won't be, so we won't be victimized again twice or three times. Please labor on that. It depends on what level you know, you're talking at. Um, when we get to the prosecution level, um, there, there are witness protection, um, 
avenues that can be gone down. Um, working basically in, local, in conjunction with local law enforcement. Um, it's grant funded through the state and through, um, and it's also handled by FDLE. Um, but, but really, by the time you've gotten to prosecution, <laughs> you're pretty far down the line. So, you know, I would defer to, uh, to local law enforcement for, for whatever solutions they have. And I go back to the collaborative effort. I, we just can't blame the victim and say, you, you should report it. It's got to be on law enforcement to mitigate and, and reduce that fear. We have to get out there. It's got to be community outreach, and you have to start trusting law enforcement if we do our part, if we start doing our job. So if you jump, if we get into an investigation, you do have to keep your mindset, not just putting a bad guy in jail or getting him some kind of level of treatment. You also have to think about that victim and protecting that victim as well. And as, as far as we were talking about earlier, if it's an active investigation, be mindful what information you're putting out while you're still um, keeping open dialogue um, with that victim or along those lines. So there is protective measures that we can take to make sure a victim is not, you know, re-victimized or, or susceptible to violence. Did, did that answer your question, Josh, or did you want a little bit more clarification there? I think that does, because I want to make sure that at the end of the day, I trust you guys. I don't know how many of on the audience have the same feeling that I have towards my friends who are in law enforcement. So I want to make sure that that is clearly uh, um, mentioned and, and portrayed here. That's a portrayal, but to, to actually say, you know what? Because at the end of the day, they're going to get your phone numbers and email addresses too when I, when I follow up to make sure that these are our friends who can call upon them and they'll act on. So the, my follow up question is this I know that. Um, prior to 2020, different things happened with hate crimes. We have done a hate crimes forum on 2020, in 2021, and 2022. If you come to the table every time with the same questions, same answers, that means there is nothing has happened except just talk. And a lot of us here, I know that we have CRB here, and we Elders Affairs, and we have many organizations, organizations represented here. We don't want to talk anymore. So what is changed after our last event of 20 and 2020, 2020 and 2021, that has changed to better protect us from such as hate crimes, um, even with um, a bias incident reporting, what has changed within our county, specifically for our county? Because most of us are here representing Miami-Dade County, so please help us to understand that. Last year, Miami-Dade County Police Department, uh, we actually put up a dashboard. It's a GIS dashboard where hate crimes are reported in there and it can tell you where it happened and what the circumstances were. There, since that we started, there's a lot more attention placed on hate crimes, right? And this is improved throughout, even though you may or may not see it. Um, we have people directly assigned, say for instance, my bureau and our Homeland Security Bureau, uh, that information in those um, reports that you do where there's an incident. We take a look at those incidents and then we do like a scrub on that individual to see if there's any other reporting or any patterns, right? And that person stays on our radar. Now, we have to be also very careful on privacy issues. One of the big things is an individual's privacy but for the victim or even the subject has certain rights to privacy. And we have to abide by um, the federal government privacy. Say for instance, we get an information, we have a time limit on we can hold that information on it until there's a crime or something that would be more than a hunch that would indicate this individual displays certain characteristics that he may or may not, he or she may or may not commit crime at a later date. So we have improved on that. Um, we, as far as with um, victim protection, we compartmentalize some of our information depending on what a crime is and what's reported. Um, when I say compartmentalize, it's that information, because it's an active investigation, that information cannot be released. Um, we'll get that information, we'll put it in a separate um, database or case tracking, as you may call it, we take a look at it. We have a time limit in which to follow up on that information. And um, it's not until it gets to the prosecution that that information will come out, which then, by then, some testimony from an individual or witnesses, depending on the circumstances, all depending on the case. Um, so it's a case-by-case -case basis. So we've improved on, on, on our process and our procedures. We have more attention given to it, and we also have a public awareness on it. But we do 
ultimately need your help in reporting it and following up. Not just become a victim of a crime, report it, and then when you're asked to give a statement or anything, you just don't show up or respond back. Um, it, it, it helps us greatly to prosecute those individuals. If I can add on to that particular dashboard that the county has, right, to report, uh, we also have within our reporting system, we have a little drop down box whether you become a victim of crime, whether it's bias related, right? The Department of Justice has a very, I'm gonna throw you guys in there, comprehensive dashboard on hate crime. So if you type in Department of Justice, hate crime, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that resources that you can call uh, and access through their particular website. And then eventually it will trickle down to us as well. Um, I don't wanna uh, jump into what um, Gilbert does because uh, just to give you an example, the extremists, Extremism, uh, extremism incident that occurred in Buffalo, New York. If that is occurring down here, and if you see on the website, social media, um, that's his shop. 